Great. So we're live and we're recording. Um, I'm welcoming the audience, but I don't see at the moment people coming in. It's a little bit early. They may be joining us from other sessions. Uh, I think uh, it's not, uh, we are uh, ahead like four or five minutes. It's yes, not, uh, it's, yes. we are not on time. We are a little bit earlier. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, it's, it's you know, I, I, I worked in Switzerland for a while, so uh, I have that habit. <laughs> it's one of those things at the World Economic Forum. <laughs> yeah. Let me see. And at the moment, it's just our names there as the uh, people who are present. Okay. Yeah, because I, I saw like 48, but I don't know. They are the message from others, other meeting, other sessions. Yeah. You had 48? Yeah, the comments, comments. Uh, yeah, but maybe they are from other session. Uh, they may be from a, from another session. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, comments. I'm just see your comment, Andrew. Um, but I think our session is as closed as it is at the moment. Okay. From, from experience um, of these, and I'm sure you've done many with, with Frank at Horasis before, but from experience, um, I tend to find that the audience in the, the session is relatively small, but that there is a lot of video watching afterwards. And I would invite you also, as I shall, to share the video afterwards on your, your networks. Okay. Yes. Two more minutes of suspense. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are we are just one 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 minute. One minute. There we go. Yeah, almost ready. There are several simultaneous event, uh, events uh, I see. And people will, people will hop in and out. Um, yes. Right, just a couple of seconds to go. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, delighted to have you with us today, this evening uh, in Europe or this afternoon in North America uh, or indeed in South America. And uh, welcoming here today our speakers um, on this excellent panel with a really quite challenging subject. Governments are supposed to discuss, not totally oppose. Well, in today's world, that has a double sense. The... Uh, the mandate we have originally when this panel was put together was really what I would describe as a micro mandate to focus on the two party system in the United States and that the party blocking each party blocking the other leading to a gridlock of legislation. 
We'd like to start with that, but we may find that actually we use that a little bit as a springboard to move from that polarization within the government within a state to some of the larger events that are going on in the world today. I'm delighted to introduce to you the panel I've got here. Um, I'm not going to spend a long time introducing them because they're going to introduce themselves. And firstly, I'd like to turn to Rosalia Artiga Serrano, former president of Ecuador and a consummate tri-sector athlete, someone who has worked in government, someone who has worked in the private sector, and someone who is very active in the leadership of civil society. Rosalia, perhaps you'd care to introduce yourself and perhaps give us, share one or two comments about our subject. Of course, thank you very much. And thank you to Oasis for inviting me to be part of this panel. And thank you uh, to our uh, moderator for the introduction. Uh, well, um, I, I can say that I started being a teacher and I'm continuing being a teacher. <laughs> Uh, it was my main goal, and it continues to be my main goal in life, to how to improve quality of education in my country and in other countries. Uh, but also, I, I have interests in politics. I was Minister of Education, Sports and Culture. I was Vice Minister of Culture, uh, Vice President and President of Ecuador. And uh, it was a period of my life that I was dedicated to politics. But... Uh, um, in, in, other, uh, in other fields, I'm a journalist. I'm quite active in journalism. I have a TV program uh, where I speak only about um, pro uh, positive things. And I have interviews with positive people during more, th more than 10, uh, 20 years. And I'm also a journalist because I write for, for newspapers and I have a radio program. And uh, I lead an NGO called FIDAL, Foundation for Integration and Development of, of Latin America. We publish a couple of magazines and uh, we do a lot of uh, work with teachers, with students, have school for leaders, uh, with migrants. Uh, and um, well, uh, personally, I'm a lot interested in literature. I'm a writer. I write books for uh, essays and other things, but also the, during the last uh, Years, I, I had more interest and more interest in uh, write for kids, uh, probably because I'm a grandma and I, I want to write for my grandkids. But I published uh, several books with some editorials here in Ecuador and also in Spain. And I participate in anthologies. And I'm also now, since uh, a couple of weeks ago, the president of uh, UNIR University in Ecuador. It's a Spanish university an online uh, Spanish university, quite active in different countries. And I'm also working in, in other tasks. I had been, I had the privilege to have been the general secretary of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. I used to work for the environmental issues of all the uh, Amazonic basin. And I'm still involved in events uh, with the Amazon. And uh, well, a lot of other things. Maybe I will spend uh, for a long time <laughs> talking and talking, but it's that. And uh, I'm, my main goal in life is about education. Rosalia, thank you very much indeed. I, I told you, the, the consummate tri-sector athlete. <laughs> thank you, Rosalia. Thank you. Let, let me turn now to, to one of our other panelists, Harry Anastasio. Harry has, um, <laughs> Harry is really on the hot seat today because Harry is a professor of International Peace and Conflict Resolution Studies in Portland, Oregon. Harry, perhaps you could introduce yourself briefly, but I know from the conversation we had a couple of days ago that you have some very specific thoughts about the situation, the polarization of government in the United States. And perhaps you could lead us straight into the subject there with a bit of a discussion about that, a few thoughts about that. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, to our other panelist here, Andrew. I also see that uh, I'm delighted to see in the room that Bill Peduto, the former mayor of Pittsburgh, has actually joined us in the audience. Um, we had thought Bill was going to be joining us in the in the panel. Then we weren't sure; thought he wasn't. Delighted to see you there, Bill. And uh, I, I will give you the floor also when I come to the right moment. I'll pass over to you as well. Harry, if I can go over there. Harry Anastasiou, 
give us a few thoughts about the subject. Yes, uh, thank you, Piers. And I think uh, you hit the nail on the head when you said uh, I am in the uh, hot seat, <laughs> actually. I have been receiving a number of invitations to talk about the Ukraine. And uh, the way I interpreted uh, that invitation is an invitation to jump into the fire. So that is, that is my, my state of, of being at this stage. But thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, a few things about my background. I was uh, raised uh, on the island of Cyprus. Um, so throughout my, practically my entire life, uh, I was part of a conflict-habituated culture with intensive uh, ethnocentric nationalisms uh, between the Greek community and the Turkish community clashing periodically and still trying to resolve an open wound from uh, past conflict. That context gave me the opportunity to really seriously think about why humans come to historical points where they turn against each other um, and what the underlying you know, causes of you know, such phenomena are all about. Um, I have been working in that domain of peace and conflict studies in the United States at Portland State University for the last uh, 20 years now. Uh, and I have also observed developments in the United States uh, post 9-11. And today, uh, the very, very polarized and conflicted uh, politics of America is really uh, at the forefront in multiple ways. Um, if you wish, I can give an initial overview of what I see to be the realities in the United States that lead to uh, gridlock when it comes to governance. Uh, I don't think you can understand the gridlock unless you understand what has taken place in what I call post 9-11 America. And I don't think you can understand the political polarization uh, unless we acknowledge that you know, high-level policy leaders are tuned into how public opinion has evolved over the last 20 years around several issues. Uh, but I think there are three historical landmarks that had a profound impact on American society and America's political culture, including public opinion and political leadership. Uh, I see uh, these three, there are three defining historical drivers, which I interpret as threats that people have experienced, different sectors of societies and different ways. The, the first threat that emerged and became part of American political life is directly linked to 9-11. And it's what I call the security threat. The security threat has really permeated American society. Uh, the issue of terrorism and counterterrorism had an impact. The anti-terrorist wars that were, have been launched uh, had an impact, as well as domestic developments that made people feel more insecure, not only with respect to enemies from outside the country, but also from enemies perceived or real from within the United States. So the security threat is one. Then there came the economic threat. The landmark for that is the meltdown of the financial system uh, in uh, 2008, uh, which raised fundamental questions as far as the stability of the financial system and the certainty that people had, had in the financial system of the United States. And then emerged Yet another, what I call a uh, threat, which I identify as the identity threat. What is extraordinary about America today is that you can talk to any group, whites, blacks, Jews, Asians, Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera, and they will all tell you that they feel that their identity is under attack. These three trends, the security threat, the economic threat, and the identity threat, have converged uh, and surfaced in a very unprecedented way, way during the pandemic. And they incubated a toxic polarization that makes governance very, very challenging. 
today in the United States. Um, it's not that political parties and their affiliates didn't have differences in the past. They had differences, but now those differences have metastasized in an all-out rivalry of all or nothing for each side. Uh, if I have time, I can you know, simply list some of the axes of polarization uh, that possibly could provide a context for further discussion. Starting from the elections, the last presidential elections, we see two trends. On the Democrat side, we see the perception of the big lie, accusing the Republican side that they have fostered and promoted the big lie that the elections were stolen. On the Republican side, especially at its base, we see the narrative of the big steal, that the elections have been stolen. So we have the big lie versus the big steal. We see uh, the Democrat side um, perceiving the Republican side as trying to erode voting rights by making voting ex uh, increasingly difficult for certain sectors of the electorate. Whereas on the Republican side, we see an attempt on the basis of the argument of fostering voter integrity to make voting far more difficult, to be stricter in terms of who has the right to vote and who doesn't. Then we also have um, identity politics show up at the, at the sub-national level and the Democrat side supports identity politics as they have supported you know, Black Lives Matter. On the Republican side, they abhor identity politics at the sub-national level because they see it as divisive. But they strongly emphasize identity politics when it comes to the national identity of the United States. A further polarization is the one that generally can be identified as Black Lives Matter on the Democrat side and Blue Lives Matter, which is support for the police on the Republican side. A further polarization is around social services. The Democrat side sees social services as something that is absolutely imperative for democracy and for support of citizens. But the Republican side sees that as a threat towards totalitarianism and their preference and their understanding of a free society is to prioritize the free market individualism, I call it. Uh, on cultural issues, uh, on the gender issue, there is a, another... It's, it's a long list, Harry. It's a long list. It's impressive. I but haven't the... read quite how vividly this polarization occurred in so many different yes. levels. Yes. Can, can we leave it, can we leave perhaps just one more, one more example from you and then we're going to move on perhaps to Andrew to comment a little bit and then yes. come back to you and build. Absolutely. Uh, even in things like gender, there's a huge gap on the Democrat side, they accept the, uh, the fundamental principle that there are multiple genders. On the Republican side and their base, the, uh, the assumption is that there are only two genders. And if you have more, is a perversion. Uh, there is also, uh, a, you know, on the one side, we have a, a preference for a critical view of history and historiography. On the other side, we have more of an ethnocentric and normalized view of history. One Harry, side supports you. diversity, the other thank side, you. unity. It goes on. It's a great list. Harry, it's, thank it's, you very it much. It can go on and on. Right. I, I'm going to go now to, to Andrew Natchison, who is a journalist. Andrew, you're a journalist. You have been both a journalist and also you've built your own journalistic business, your own media business, new media business, I understand. And you're also very active in community affairs and rolling out a major series of community programs. Andrew, as a journalist, listening to Harry, you can take your pick. Which one of those do you want to focus on or do you want to build on all of them? How would you like to comment, perhaps, on, on, on Harry's points there? Uh, I, I think I'd like to build on them. I don't, I don't uh, disagree with anything he said. Um, and in fact, um, I, I presume the list is even longer. Uh, and, and, and in a way, that's the, um, uh, a, a key challenge 
uh, which is the complexity of forces that are at play, um, you know, which makes solutions uh, incredibly difficult. Um, uh, What I would offer is some some additional context um, uh, or uh, thoughts on um, why we're in this uh, seemingly, you know, impossible place where, 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 um, you know, our politics are so divided and so divisive that progress on anything um, in most cases is almost impossible. Um, it's, it's, it, it's, de- it's deadlock. It's, it's dispute. Um, and, and, and the dispute goes on. The solution is always elusive. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've seen some, uh, some recent forces at play, um, but also there's history. Um, uh, you know, you know, for me as a, as, as a journalist and, and a media entrepreneur, um, I am, um, a, obsessed and maybe biased, uh, by interest in, uh, what I've called for a long time networked culture. Uh, and, 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 and I think in terms of network knowledge and culture, uh, and, uh, I came, I came into that realm, um, early when the web was being created. Um, and I came into it, um, full of hope and what you might even mock as utopian, um, ideals and aspirations for how an interconnected planet um, would drive us toward um, democracy, liberal ideals, um, and and a new economy uh, based on uh, understanding and respect uh, for each other. Uh, a- a- and in fact, uh, things have not turned out that way. <laughs> um, a- a- in fact, just the opposite, um, which is um, heartbreaking. Uh, and in retrospect, you know, um, maybe was predictable. Uh, and, and my earlier um, uh, hopes were naive. Uh, uh, but, you know, we, we have to confront what we've created uh, and, um, and try to figure out some way out of this. You know, there's, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. Um, we, we are forever a network culture. Um, although dictators are eager to try to control that uh, and roll it back where they can, um, as we saw today, uh, Facebook being shut down in Russia. Um, uh, but but uh, I, I call it the, the crippling chaos of network culture. Uh, so so why, you know why is network culture um, uh, so important to this? Uh, to this, you know, dystopian reality that w- that we're stuck in, um, uh, a- a- and uh, I think uh, uh, some of the answer is uh, about how these networks have been engineered. So there's a technical there's a technical problem uh, with our information environment, uh, which implies there might be some technical solutions. You know, the biggest one is that. Um, uh, the biggest platforms are optimized uh, to uh, to um, not only favor but actually kind of incentivize dispute. Uh, dispute and conflict uh, are are the um, the currency of social media platforms, um, and you know that has cultural problems because it you know it leads to more dispute, but it also has um, you know, it, it creates practical challenges because politicians and leaders and the people who inform and influence them uh, 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 see that con- conflict um, uh, scores more points than reconciliation. Um, uh, so, so we're now in an environment where uh, uh, conflict is recorded, is rewarded, um, and solutions are not. Um, um, and obviously, that's a profound problem. But Andrew, let, 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 let me challenge you there, please. I mean, surely please in politics, there has always been conflict. I mean, in, in Britain, we have that notion of the loyal opposition, 
Um, but it's the notion that there is absolutely conflict across two sides, very often two sides of a house, sometimes more broadly. So, so why is it that the, this particular, it, it's reached such a stage where political conflict has turned into something so, um, so, so, so toxic? I'm going to, Andrew, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to move on there. I'm, I'm going to give the floor. Bill Peduto, I'm going to invite you on stage. Bill was meant to be part of our group, and then we weren't sure if he was going to be able to make it. I'm delighted to see you there, Bill. I'd like to invite you on stage. If you could share from the political perspective, and I'm sure that you were elected. Bill is a former mayor of Pittsburgh. I'm sure you could just give us two or three brief comments about why you think that the political um, the, the, the healthy debate of politics and the discussion of, of political um, life has turned into something quite so toxic. Bill, over to you. I'm inviting you on stage now. And I hope this wonderful system is going to work. <laughs> And, and then, Rosalia, I'm going to come to you as another elected politician with similar similar points. I see also some comments coming from one of our guests. Um, ah, Mahesh is saying, media make money from destroying comedy. That is the problem with the puppet media. That's challenging. Andrew, you're going to have to pick that one up. Bill, are well, you with us? Let's wait for Bill, yeah. Not sure if we're trying once more, Bill. Um, if it doesn't work this time, I'm 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 actually going to go back to to Andrew to let him answer that challenging comment that came in from Mahesh. Well, okay, sure. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, 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 I'm actually um, not, you know, uh, not not so negative on for-profit media. Um, uh, uh, it, it, it so happens that. Um, the the business landscape for for profit media has also changed radically, um, uh, at, at, and um, the the economics of media uh, do create new challenges there. Um, but um, look, you know, m media one way or the other needs needs revenue um, uh, to happen. <laughs> Uh, but, I, but but I want before we get to Bill, I just want to because this question of money uh, is another important one, and that gets back to politics. You know, I talked about social media, uh, but the role of of capital uh, in American politics, in particular, uh, I, I I do think is is a recent factor that has changed the the the, the formulation for how our politics works. Okay, um, Andrew, thank you very much for that, and yes, big money causes big distress sometimes. Bill, over to you. Delighted that you've been able to join us, that we managed to get the technology to work for, for us to be able to see you. If you could just give us a very, very short snapshot as to who you are, and then comment on these, uh, this political divide, and then we'll hand over to Rosalia, also as an elected official, elected politician, to, to, uh, to comment also. Thank you, Pierce. Um... My name is Bill Peduto. I am the former mayor of Pittsburgh. I was canceled in the 2021 election by the woke crowd. Um, the interesting part of that is in the past 20 years, I was the architect of a very conservative Democratic City's progressive movement. Um, Pittsburgh, as many people know, collapsed with the um, devastation of heavy manufacturing and steel. And like many cities in the Rust Belt, it was a very conservative type of democratic city. In fact, when I was elected in 2013, I was the first pro-choice mayor, and we had an elected and a Republican since 1932. The very uh, assemblage of city council during that 10-year period before was a uh, creation of those that fought to stay, even though we were facing unemployment of over 20% greater than during the Great Depression. 
um, a group of young people decided that we would rebuild Pittsburgh, building out an art scene, building out a tech city, building out a city built upon education and medicine and rebuilding an entire city from the ashes. And we were successful. In fact, during the eight years that I was mayor, we increased the revenue of the city by 17%. And in that same time period, we faced what is in what uh, Harry was saying, the very essence of a national hard wiring of a binary decision making, where if you like this, you must hate this. And where both on the far left and on the far right, there was no way to be able to do what we were doing 20 years ago. We put together the Blue Green Alliance when steel and environment couldn't work together. We brought the Sierra Club and the steel workers at the table and said, we have to create a way to have good jobs and green jobs. And we were able to have communication. That all fell apart in the past six years. And one had to hate the other. And that type of a communication with especially the younger voters within the Democratic Party began to become something that fell apart. That's number one, that on both extremes, there was no communication to bring together, only communication which would separate and push the polarization farther apart. And anybody who was looked at on either side is somebody who would try to be able to listen or to work towards a compromise was looked as a sellout. Number two, the gerrymandering on the national level. When you created these districts that had 70% performance for either party, you created that essence to move towards those polarizing ends in order not to get primaried. And on both sides, they created their own systems for their own safety. And between that happening at the national level and it's spilling over to the state level, and then it's spilling over to the local level, you created a system that sort of catapulted itself. And then finally, what Andrew was saying, social media was the gasoline that threw it on the fire. The printing press was invented. And we saw the revolutions in France and the United States. The radio was invented and the television. And we saw world wars happening. And social media was invented. And people took advantage of it. The use in order to be able to manipulate messages, in order to be able to push political messaging, has been so overwhelming that it is being utilized in order to be able for the right to influence the far left and the left to influence the far right, and people don't even know it's happening. Bill, thank you very much for that. that was the, those were very sort of cogent, clear, articulate comments and very balanced, and thank you for that. Very helpful indeed. Rosalia, you're, you're, in this context, you're an observer. You, like I, are not within the United States. We're observers from afar, um, which gives us perhaps uh, a different perspective. And you, Rosalia, as the former president of a country, um, as someone who has, has, I'm sure, lived through political conflict as well, could you, could you comment a little bit and perhaps synthesize the points that, uh, that we've heard from, uh, from our three uh, North American, our three American guests this evening. And let me just give you a time check. Um, we're we're, we're two-thirds of the way through. We've got 15 minutes left to go. Um, and so maybe after that, we might perhaps look up, take our sights a little bit higher and move out of the cauldron of the United States to that rather nasty cauldron which is happening in Eastern Europe at the moment, where governments are not discussing and they are totally opposed. But Rosalia, first to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, probably I can provide a, a, a view and some points from outside, from Latin America. Um, I, I want to, to uh, call the attention that uh, Latin American people is growing in the United States. 
And of course, we have a lot of Latin mayors and authorities in many cities or from Latin origin in, in many cities in North America. And, and of course, it's so important for us what's happening in America because uh, uh, our countries, most of our countries, had uh, uh, the, the sendings of money from the United States to our countries. Um, and I am part of a, a country, in Ecuador, the Ecuador, uh, that has uh, the dollar like a currency. We are a dollarized country. Then everything that's happening there is affecting us in, in a direct way. Even now, when it's happening, the, the war in, in Ukraine, we, we feel all this globalization and the need to analyze what's happening in the other countries. When um, the situations, uh, the bad situations in the United States happen with the political um, uh, fight uh, between the Republicans and Democrats, uh, in many newspapers of Latin America, we had in the first page saying United States is a banana republic. Mm? Because we see from far what was happening there, and it was very similar about what's happening in, in most of our countries, with the kind of people doesn't believe in the others, the uncertainty, uh, the very aggressive vocabulary, and uh, the decision to take the power for the by the force. Mm? Uh, it was happening in the United States, and we almost cannot believe what was happening there. And uh, I feel that this role model of democracy going down, going down, uh, and the similar is happening in what's ha what uh, um, if we analyze what um, uh, is uh, going on in in Europe, because when we feel that the two world wars were European wars, and this next the what's happening now is happening in Europe, we said, where are our role models? Where we can find? the answers for a lot of questions that you have, that we have, uh, a lot of uncertainty, it is true. But we didn't uh, learn uh, from the history and we didn't learn also from what the pandemic situation teach us during the last uh, two years about uh, respecting the nature, about uh, respecting the others, about trying to be solidar with the other people. We didn't learn. Uh, and, and that is uh, really sad um, I don't believe that uh, because I hear a lot about what's happening with the media and the press and the journalism. I don't think it's uh, the fault about the journalism. We have to look more deeper because journalists, and we are three journalists here, uh, uh, we are the results of this society. Uh, we are not uh, uh, coming from other planet. Hmm? Like the politicians, they are not coming from other planets. They are coming from the earth and uh, from the societies that we create. And uh, that's the reason that I focus uh, my energy and me de my decision to work uh, on education. Because if we don't educate our politicians, if we don't educate our journalists, what future are we going to have? Maybe no future? Maybe a, a, a worse future for the next generations? Because we are not paying attention of what's happening in the schools. And I'm not talking about universities. I'm talking about primary schools and high schools. What's happening there? What they are listening, what they are learning, what they are saying, how they are acting, how they are behaving. Uh, and that is a tremendous uh, um, charge in, in our consciousness. Maybe we, we didn't uh, think about what we have to do. And I, I like to, to talk a lot about why we don't build new citizens. Uh, and um, uh, we talk um, about the, the gl a global world, not only a global, with all the situations that we have, because we are a globalized citizens because of the technology and the environment and the finance. Because if uh, it's a bankrupt in, in one part of the world, we are going to suffer the consequences. Nowadays, we cannot uh, send our our bananas, because our, we are the big exporter of bananas of the world. We cannot sell our roses to Russia. To Russia, we, are, we cannot sell out our shrimps to that side of the world because what's, what's happening there? there? We are a globalized world. But we need to look to, 
to look at the local, the local, the identity of the people, because local is the identity, our beliefs, our religion, our uh, ethnicities, uh, uh, our, our way to, to behave. Uh, if we mix, uh, not like a neologism only, but uh, 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 the conceptual way to, to, to conceive it, um, we can build probably a better world, a global world, respecting the others, because we never and we are not teaching how to respect the others, to, to listen to the others. Because uh, most of the time we want to talk, but we are not listening what the others feel, how the others, uh, the, the belief, beliefs of, of the others. We need to pay attention to that if we want to, to build this, this, uh, this world. Um, and I'm sure that we can talk a lot about this and uh, probably don't agree, but I want to listen to you. Probably we don't agree. We don't have the same way to behave, but I want to listen to you. And that's so important. And we have to teach and to learn that. It's that, 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 that classic comment about uh, listening to hear, not listening to reply. Um, yes. Rosalia, thank you for that. Really powerful. Um, I, I picked up, I think, two points I'd just like to pick up. One is the distinction I think I draw between journalists and social media. Bill talked about social media as being the gasoline. Um, the word media doesn't necessarily mean journalist. I think what we find with social media is that the, 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 the outlets have been hijacked and not by journalists. They're hijacked by people trying to pass particular political messages as opposed to people trying to practice, a, a, how should I say, a, a, a profession of journalism. But I think that's one, one interesting point. The other thing, Rosalia, what, 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 um, as, as a Brit who deplores Brexit, I look at the global EU. The EU is precisely that. It is, in fact, a global or a European concept, which tries at the same time to allow local identities to exist. Um, not only tries, but cherishes those local identities, but within a broader common purpose. Um, that, of course, is on the one hand has been threatened, and on the other hand, some people would argue strengthened by what's happening in Ukraine. I heard someone quipping the other day that Putin is the greatest European of them all because he has managed to bring together a very solid air response. Harry, can I come to you? Because this is your special, special field in many respects, the whole of this aspect of conflict and peace. Um, and, and yes, I want to raise it up from the United States to looking at that in the 10 minutes or less that we've got left. Just, it's literally a couple of minutes from each of you, but Harry, please kick us off on that. Well, uh, let, let me start by saying that what we're witnessing is a, a tragic landmark in European history. Doesn't matter which side you support and how you interpret things, but it's tragic. Uh, at the same time, I see this uh, conflict and its eruption into violence as the tip of a historical iceberg that goes as far back as the late 90s. Uh, one way to sort of summarize that history uh, is to acknowledge that Ukraine emerged from the Soviet system, a very poor country, eventually became ethnocentrically polarized. Uh, it led to the 2014 civil war, which was real and it was violent. And if you read the accounts of the United Nations and, and the Human Rights Watch, uh, you will see that atrocities and abductions and torture was committed by both sides. Uh, so in that context, the, you have various grievances and various fears. The, the, um, the ethnic Russians within the Ukraine, their big fear was the majority Ukrainians and especially the hardline nationalists among them. When you look at the Ukrainian side, what you see is that their big fear is the power of Russia. And when you look at Russia, their big fear is NATO. Not because of NATO's intention, because NATO made it clear, you know, their intention is not to attack anyone. Their intention is a defensive system. But what the Russians see is not the intention, is the is the capacity of NATO's firepower, which includes their nuclear weapons. 
and uh, which is based on the principle of weapons transfers, because within the 30 NATO countries, weapons can be transferred. And the Russian grievance is that while they always tried to approach NATO and, you know, in about 2000, they even suggested that Russia is considered to join NATO. Their feeling is that they have been snubbed and isolated, while all the former Soviet states of Central and Eastern Europe have been integrated into NATO. So from their perspective, they see, when they look at the map, they see the, uh, the, the Iron Curtain moving closer to their borders. Okay? And this, uh, this is a long history that has now surfaced in violence. Now the violence. I'm going to, I'm going to, Harry. I'm going to, I'm going to, in order to just move yes, on, please. conscious of time. But the thing that fascinates me there, you pick, you describe there the three threats that you also described about the United States: yes. security, economic, and identity. Yes. Same, yeah. same, same things. Thing. Right. Absolutely. Now over to you, Andrew. A couple of comments from you, please. Well, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just add to that, you know, very briefly. Uh, you know, the information ecology is at play there as well. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and let me stress, um, you know, the chaos of our network culture is not only about its capacity to divide us. Uh, it's also capacity to confuse us, to make us crazy. Um, truth is no longer uh, a necessity for political discourse. Um and in fact, lies aren't even the alternative to truth. Confusion uh, itself is the, the mechanism uh, that, that leads us to total breakdown. Um, that's, a, that's an amazing soundbite. Andrew, thank you. Confusion is the mechanism that leads us to total breakdown. Bill Peduto, a quick word from you, and then to Rosalia for a final sentence. Sure. I, uh, I want to just to uh, abridge from what uh, Andrew said. There's a very good article in Vice today about how there is information coming from the Kremlin um, that is being used by the far left that is actually in order just to take the attention off of Ukraine, showing where war is happening all over the world and how everyone's so Eurocentric that they're not talking about what is happening in the other places of the earth. But I want to leave us on a good note. You know, there's a saying in the United States, and it's there's three parties in the America right now. There's Democrats, there's Republicans, and there are mayors. And mayors don't look at things like, how do we pick up the garbage in a liberal or conservative way? We know that Monday at 6 a.m. the garbage has to be picked up. And it goes across the world. And when you look at mayors, they have a very pragmatic way of looking at how technology can provide people, how you can do it more efficiently, more equitably. And we all speak the same language. I had the honor of serving as the, as the North American representative of the Global Covenant of Mayors. I'll tell you this, the solution is at the local level. And by working at the national level, we can address climate change, we can address refugee crisis and everything else. We need to Rosalia, to Rosalia on, on and time. Change the mind. Thank you. For totally, that. totally agree. Totally agree with the mayor uh, because I, I, I have a lot of trust in local authorities uh, because they know exactly what's happening on the land. Uh, but uh, I want to, to put a point about women's vision. What would happen the leaders of the countries will be women instead of men? Uh, uh, what, what will happen if, uh, instead of this, all this, uh, this exhibition of forces? We can talk uh, from other side of, of, of the vision. And uh, that's probably an exercise that we may do in the future. What happens if, if women are leading the countries? When we see the, what happens with the pandemic situation and uh, with the women leaders in New Zealand or in Taiwan or in, 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 in other countries uh, uh, doing different things, asking the, uh, the uh, kids 
to talk with the parents, for example, in New Zealand, say, yeah, my, my press conference is with kids and the kids are going to talk with the, with, with, the, with the families or to talk with influencers and say, oh, we need influencers to keep the people uh, at home on, or using masks or doing that. Uh, maybe the world could be different if women are in, will be in power more often than it happens in the past. Rosalia, thank you for that. And that point about kids, it, 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 I have to wrap on this then. Um, this it's been going around on the social media, but apparently um, President Zelensky of uh, Ukraine, in his inaugural address, said, "Do not put a portrait of me on the wall. Do not look at me as a president, as an icon, as an idol. Put your kids' photos on the wall and think of them when you make decisions." My panelists, you've been wonderful today. We're out of time, but at the same time, our minds are very full with the ideas you've shared with us. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a great privilege for me to have you on this harasses session. Governments opposed to discuss, not totally opposed, but thank you very much indeed. And I hope that we shall have the pleasure of meeting again at some stage, even ideally physically, rather than virtually. Yeah. So goodbye, goodbye to our audience. Thank, Thank you very, you very much, much for having the floors and look forward to the next opportunity. Thank you, Piers. Thank you all. Thank you. It was a pleasure. A pleasure to talk. <laughs>